in Acts chapter 15, and if you are new here at CCF, what we do here is go through a book of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And so we are in the book of Acts, and we are right in the middle of Acts chapter 15. And last time, about two weeks ago, uh, in the book of Acts, we, we talked about how these certain men came from Judea all the way to Antioch, and, and basically to tell the church there that the Gentiles, in order to be saved, they had to be Jewish before they could be saved. And the Gentiles could be saved, that's the idea, they could be saved, but first they had to become Jewish and become under the Mosaic law. Most specifically, they talked about circumcision, but that was really sort of just an entry point to all the Mosaic laws, right? Well, we saw that Paul and Barnabas, who saw the Holy Spirit working so uh, heavily on the Gentiles themselves, they didn't agree with that, right? They strongly disagreed with these certain men from Judea who came uh, and debated the matter with them. But the matter was not settled there in Antioch, and so they decided to go to Jerusalem. And so they go down to Jerusalem, and they had this big church council. Remember where all the elders and the apostles were there, and their brethren were all there? They gathered together, and they kind of hashed this thing out, right? And, and so first there was a lot of arguing back and forth. And then Peter stands up and he speaks, and that kind of lays, lays the ground for Paul and Barnabas to speak about what God did through the Holy Spirit with the Gentiles uh, on their first missionary journey. And then finally, James st stands up and kind of makes the announcement, and, and it's not the martyr James. I wrote that on my notes because we talked about the martyr James. This is actually the brother of Jesus, James, the half-brother of Jesus. And this is what, essentially, he said, this is how it's going to be. We're not going to trouble these Gentiles. Right? And, and so it was decided. And now, in the aftermath of that council decision, they write a letter. And we talked a little bit about that letter, and I didn't really go into too much detail because I knew we were going to be covering it today. And that's what we're going to be diving into starting here at verse 22. But before we do, let me just take this up in a word of prayer one more time. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just pray that, uh, Lord, first of all, anything of me just is forgotten. It falls to the ground, it's forgotten, it doesn't matter. But Lord, anything of you that's from your scripture and from the Holy Spirit, God, I just pray that it penetrates the hearts. That people, can, uh, that people including myself, just understand uh, just the, the love and the mercy and the grace that we, we receive from you, God. And God, we, we see that, that uh, your word goes through and that the generations and it continues today and how important this letter was to, to confirming that we are saved by faith in you. And so we thank you for that, God. And I pray that you just, uh, you just speak through this message. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's dive in. This is Acts chapter 15, starting at verse 22. And so then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of, of their co own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Namely, Judas, whose also name is Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. And so, first of all, I, I love this. In verse 22, it says, It pleased the apostles, the church, and get this, with the whole church. And I love it because it shows kind of the, the humility of those certain men who came from Judea who sort of caused all this trouble, the, the telling the Gentiles that they needed to be uh, Jewish and follow the, the laws of, of, of Moses. And, and so they all agreed. That's what I love about this, the whole church. And I would say much credit would go to these certain men who allowed themselves to be convinced and, be, be, uh, uh, and look at the evidence from Scripture and from the other people and confirming it through the Holy Spirit. They all agreed, including those certain men. And I would almost say that we can admire those certain men because... There's certain aspects of like, they are sticking to their guns. They, they believe in something so strongly that they're going to travel. Remember, we say they traveled like 300 miles to tell this to them. And so they, were, they followed their convictions. And I think there is something to be said about that, right? I mean, someone who will stand up for what they believe in, that's something that we can admire, right? But I would say even more admirable is the way that they could be taught, you know, and, and shown that they were wrong and, and be able to admit that. A teachable spirit is a precious, precious thing. And those certain men who came down and caused the trouble to begin with, they had a teachable spirit because the whole church agreed. And so the whole church agreed and says to send men of their own company to Antioch. 
And so the, the Jerusalem Council wisely chose these two guys uh, from their own community. They're probably Jewish Christians themselves, and they take them, they say, go with Paul and Barnabas uh, back to Antioch, the, to place where all this started, where the but, dispute started. Dispute started. And, I, and I say it was wise to, to take Judas and, and Silas with them, because what if they went by themselves and someone was said, hey, y'all are lying. That letter that you, ha- that you have, that's fabricated. It's fake, right? I mean, it very easily could have gone that way. But the church had wisdom to send them people with their own company, Judas and Silas, to say, yes, this is the decision of the, of the Jerusalem council. This is legit. This is what they decided, right? And so starting in verse 23, we see the contents of this letter that is written, sent, by, sent with these men. It says, they wrote this letter by them, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to their brethren who are the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seems good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same thing by word of mouth. For it seemed good, I love this, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these, you will do well. Farewell. And so that's the letter, right? And it opens up with who is, who is sending the letter. It's the apostles, the elders, and the brethren. And so we see this letter expresses the decision of that Jerusalem council, right? Uh, the Gentiles should consider themselves under no obligation to the rituals of, of Judaism, except the sensitivity which love requires. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And, 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 and that's to preserve the fellowship of the Jews and the Gentile believers. And so then they address who the audience is to, right? It says, to their brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. And so this letter wasn't to all Gentile churches, but very specifically these places where the churches where Jews and Gentiles mixed together with potential of tension and conflict. And so these three regions mentioned here could run into the same exact problem that Paul and Barnabas ran into on their first missionary journey. And so I I love what it it said, and I I mentioned this when when I read it. It says, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. I just love that. Because James, during that council meeting, he voices the decision, right? In Acts chapter 15, verse 19, he says, Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those among the Gentiles who are turning to God. But the unity behind that decision, right, was one of several evidences that was in the work of the Holy Spirit, right? You see, the Holy Spirit spoke through James when he said that, but he was also confirming it through others, Remember, we saw the Holy Spirit work in the lives of the Gentiles right in front of Peter's eyes with Cornelius and Cornelius' household. The Holy Spirit fell upon them. They started speaking in tongues like the day of Pentecost. And, Paul, and Peter was like, wow, they didn't have to be Jewish first. They don't have to go through circumcision or anything. The Holy Spirit fell on them, right? And so then Paul, Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey saw the Holy Spirit doing wonders and works through the Gentiles. And some amazing things were happening, right? And so much so that they could say that that decision that was made was in, in collaboration with the Holy Spirit and saying it seems good to me, and it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And so it says, and seems good to, to uh, the Holy Spirit and to us, and then verse 28 continues, it says, to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these things, you will do well. And so, again, a few weeks ago, uh, when we first covered chapter 15, I said I didn't have time to cover that because I knew that I would get to cover it here. And, and so the, the idea here with James' decision is that the Gentile believers should not be under the laws of Moses, and was given, but it was given with practical instructions, as we see here. The idea was that it was important for these Gentile believers not to act in a way that would offend the Jewish community, right? 
that would, uh, th- that they're going into every city and, it, and that they wouldn't defend and destroy basically the witness to, the, to those Jewish people in those cities. And so on the flip side of that though, if, it's, if a decision was made that you did not have to become Jewish to be a Christian, well on the flip side of that, you should also say that, hey, you don't have to abandon your Jewish beliefs and rituals in order to be a Christian, right? And so on the flip side of that, and so let's look at these specific things that, that, we're told, that they were told to abstain from. Notice the first three things on the list. It says they, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, and from things strangled. And so those three commands have to do with the eating habits of the Gentiles, right? And, and, though, and, and though they were not bound by the laws of Moses, they were bound by the law of love, as are we. We're bound by the law of love. The law of love told them, don't unnecessarily antagonize your Jewish brothers and sisters, both in and out of the church. Right? And so then the letter says to not abstain from sexual immorality. Now, this one is interesting. As, as I was looking at this one, um, when James declared and warned the Gentile Christians not to, uh, or to abstain from sexual immorality, uh, it is it, actually... We shouldn't think that it was simply meant sex outside of marriage. Because, and I say that because all Christians, Jews and Gentiles, already believed that was wrong, right? They already knew that that was something that they shouldn't do. And so instead, James told these Gentiles living in such a close fellowship with their Jewish brothers and believers to observe the specific marriage regulations as requires in Leviticus 18, which prohibits marriage between most family relations which is something that would absolutely offend the Jewish brothers, but it was what the Gentiles, they, they wouldn't really think anything of that. And so that, that's what the, the deal is. And see, when they told them to abstain from these things, that, the, that things, the Gentile Christians had every right, every right to eat meat sacrificed to idols, right? And actually that's going to be brought up eventually later, that later on Paul has to bring this up again. And he talks about this. Uh, and, but also, they, can, they have the right to continue in their marriage practices and to eat things that are from kosher and without, without the kosher bleeding because these are the aspects of the Mosaic law that they are free from. They're not under that. However, they are to keep the peace, so to speak, right? And so they weren't to flaunt these freedoms in front of, the, in front of people that they have in Christ, but to lay down their rights to lay down their right in these matters, to display love to their fellow believers, these Jewish brethren, right? And I, and I think this is a very important thing for us to understand. Because in our day and age, we're, we're faced with a lot of opportunities where I think we can kind of flaunt our freedoms, so to speak, and needlessly and offend people in our community. Now, one thing we don't mind offending people with is the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? We will never back down from that because this is it. This is who Jesus is. This is what he did, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's what Jesus said. And if that offends you, if that says, oh, well, you know, you're closed-minded and and that's intolerant. Well, it's not what I said. It's what Jesus said, right? Right? It's not what I said, but I'm happy to tell you what Jesus said. And I think it's very important for us to say, yes, this is the case for when speaking about Jesus. But there's other things. Other things we can say, listen, you know, I believe what I believe, but I'm not going to needlessly offend you over this matter. I'm not going to uh, overly offend you over this this principle that that I believe. No, I want you to hear the words of Jesus because that's more important. And friends, I, I think this is a, a huge issue. Uh, the, the idea was that it was important that these Gentile believers not act in a way to offend the Jewish community in these cities and destroy the witness there among them, right? Isn't that important? The decision was clear, though, right? This letter was written, and the decision was clear. You don't have to become Jewish in order to become a Christian. The decision was very clear in that letter. But it was also clear in that letter uh, what are you going to do with the freedoms that you have? What are you going to do with them? Are you going to love other people even though you have these freedoms? And so let me just give you a little challenge this morning. Maybe this is something that, that, that you struggle with. 
When was the last time you laid down a freedom for the sake of love? When was the last time you laid down a freedom for the sake of, of somebody else, for love? You know, in Jesus, you know, you're free to do it. You're free to do this. You're free to do that. But out of love for somebody else, you want to just lay down that freedom. When was the last time you did that? I mean, because think about it. Isn't that an outstanding measure of how valuable we consider love, or on the flip side, how valuable we consider our own freedoms? I mean, I being from America, you know, I grew up in a culture that puts very high value on, on freedom and independence. The country, United States is founded on independence and freedom. And, and I think that is a, a really good thing. But I also think there's a potential downside to that. And I'll tell you that what the downside is, it is that we value freedom above loving others. That's the downside. You may have freedom to do certain things, but... Friends, how do you do with love? How do you do with loving others? Are you willing to give up that thing out of love for your brother or sister, even in this own congregation? And we come from different backgrounds and different things like that, you know? And so are you willing to give up those things out of love that will demonstrate something even to the community and say, I love you and I love this community, right? What will you do to kind of curtail your freedom, so to speak? Not for the sake of legalism. Not for the sake of legalism. I'll say it one more time for emphasis. Not for the sake of legalism, but out of love for other people. I mean, that was the true mark that we see here in this letter. And friends, this is something I think that each one of us has to deal with in our own walk with the Lord. I mean, do you realize how amazing freedom that we have in Jesus Christ? We have, it's so amazing. He sets us free and we are not declare Christian because of how good we are. We're not declared Christian because of anything else other than Jesus Christ. We're not declared Christian because we kept the Ten Commandments or some other laws or list of rules. We're not declared Christian for any other reason but putting our faith in Jesus Christ. That's what it is. That's, that's what saves us. It's His work on the cross. It, that's our salvation. That's what makes us followers of Him. And so, let me tell you that there's tremendous freedom, but there's also responsibility of love for one another. And so you've got the freedom. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you're free, and when you're in, in Christ, you're free indeed, right? But now, add to that the glorious love of God, and you'll see God doing amazing things if you, if you allow yourself to do that. And so it's fitting, I think, that this letter ends with farewell. Because it, it settled the matter, right? There, there's this issue, and the issue is settled. Uh, from here, this is the infancy. This is like the beginning of Christianity, essentially. And for all time, it, this, this letter declares we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not by the conformity of laws. And, and such obedience comes from a true faith, a true faith, after the issue of salvation has been settled. And so... Here we see it's established in the church. Yet unfortunately, there are many churches who continue, who to continue to insist on a righteousness through works and have established their standard of holiness on their do's and their don'ts. And, and in order that you might be, uh, to be righteous standing before God, you have to do this and that. I mean, the Galatian church, right, had the same problem after Paul left that area. And, and these certain men came in and essentially said, hey, Paul doesn't have any authority here. I mean, he's just a self-proclaimed prophet. No one laid hands on him. Hey, look, you have to become Jewish. You're not saved, but you're not justified by faith, right? You've got to keep the laws of Moses and all these things to prove your righteousness. That's what they said. Now, listen to what Paul wrote to those Galatians. I love this. Paul just has some, some uh, I don't know, some, some grit to him, I guess I could say. This is what he says in Galatians 3. Oh, foolish Galatians. That's how he starts it out. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly betrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the work of the law or by the hearing of faith? Right? I mean, think about Jesus in the Gospels. When he was healing someone, it was always because he saw faith in them 
and that faith healed them, right? And so he's saying, is it hearing of the faith, right? He's kind of like, remember what, what brought you to this point. He says, are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And so Paul writing to the Colossians here, who, who would have been subverted by this undercurrent of trying to Judaize Christianity, which, as you can see, was very prevalent in the early days. And so this letter is so stinking important. The issue was established for the church. This letter made it official. The founding church essentially approved this message along with the Holy Spirit. Now starting at verse 30, Paul, Barnabas, Silas, and Judas go and deliver the letter. And so when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced over the encouragement. I mean, this letter was absolutely something to rejoice over, right? I mean, just imagine, put yourself in the Gentile's shoes here, right? They're, they're wondering how the decision might come out. Are, would, would the council in Jerusalem decide that we're really not saved after all? Or are we saved by faith? Or do we have to submit to the laws of Moses? And so it makes sense that, that after they read it, that there's rejoicing over this encouragement. Because they saw that the grace, the principle of grace has, prever, per, has prevailed, is preserved. They heard that they were saved and right in God through faith, after all. And so the letter was sent, the letter was read, and there was great encouragement. Now, starting at verse 32, we see the work of the gospel continue there in Antioch. Now, Judas and Silas, themselves being prophets also, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from, from the brethren to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And so the first thing we see here is that we see the gospel continues through Judas and Silas. These are our two who serve well in Antioch as visiting ministers from Jerusalem. Those are the ones that came with them to give the word of mouth and confirming the letter, right? And then Judas returns to Jerusalem and leaving Silas in Antioch for, for future ministry. As a matter of fact, uh, we're actually going to see by the end of this chapter that, that Silas goes on a, a, a missionary journey, his, Paul's second missionary journey with him. Which makes sense because Paul and Barnabas, as it says in verse 35, Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Now, if you go back to Acts chapter 15, when those certain men had come and kind of from Judea to Antioch, there was a great potential there to, to kind of ruin the work of God there in Antioch and beyond. But that's not what happened. Instead, the situation was hand, handled correctly, and the brethren were strengthened, and the word of God continued to go forth there in Antioch. And so, remember just a minute ago, I said that Paul would go on his second missionary journey, not with Barnabas, but with Silas, right? And so here, starting at verse 36, we begin the story of how that came about. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. And so, so far, we've seen Paul sort of be like a, a pioneer evangelist, right? We would go to, to these new cities, preach the word of God, and as the Holy Spirit uh, 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 reached people, then, then church communities were, were born. And so Paul understood the importance of telling people about Jesus and establishing these Christian communities. But he also understood the importance of strengthening and encouraging those Christians, right? And so that was the initial motivation for this second missionary journey. The first missionary journey was to go tell people about Jesus. And as the Holy Spirit spoke to people, that, that developed a church. And his second missionary journey was to go encourage those people. And so Paul had a heart to both bring people to the body of Christ and to grow people in the body of Christ. 
He wanted people to come to understand who Jesus is and what he had done for them on the cross, that through the cross, Jesus died and he resurrected. And when he resurrected, it was proof that he, he could, in fact, forgive our sins and that he, in fact, was the Son of God through grace that is only found in Jesus. And he was successful at that, right? That was his whole first missionary journey. It was all, that's how all these churches were developed. People in every city that he's returning to came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But now they need to be fed, right? Now they need to be encouraged to keep going, to persevere. Now, I imagine that some of you may have felt this way. Some of you may have felt discouraged at some point in your life. You may be even feel discouraged right now. Maybe it could be a, a failing grade. It could be, you know, a death in the family. It could be someone spoke something harsh or hurtful words to you or, or someone poking fun at what you believe. You know, and on and on and on. That list can go on and on. And for the people in the book of Acts, it's the same thing. The situation is different, but the need to persevere is the same. As a matter of fact, Paul writes in, in Romans 5, 3 through 5, this is what he says. It says, we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, Paul knew of the great encouragement and the need to continue growth in the Lord. He knows that we need to persevere and have perseverance that produces character. And he knows of the hope that does not disappoint, right? And so he wants to go and see how these people who are converted to Christianity in all these cities, how they're doing, right? He wants to check up on these baby believers, if you will, these new believers, and encourage them in the Lord to, to persevere, to keep going. He wants them to, he wants them to be carefully nurtured and growing the faith, in their faith. And isn't that what each one of us need, especially in, in times that we feel heavy, right? We need, to, we need brothers and sisters in Christ to come and encourage us, hey, keep going, keep persevering in the Lord. That's what we need. And I hope that you have that. I really hope that you have people like that in your life. And if you don't, let me just say you're in the right place. This is, this is the right place for you. People have walked in this room exactly like you, afraid, tired, feeling alone. And let me just say, you're not alone in this, right? And, and so that's what CCF strives to be. It strives to be a place where people can come together and be encouraged in the Lord and learn more about their faith and a place where we can grow as believers. That's the, that's the goal of, of CCF. I mean, think about this. God gave us each other. As a matter of fact, I, I was going through a devotional and I, it said something very uh, something I want to share with you. It said that the term one another is in Scripture over a hundred times. Over a hundred times. And so that tells me how important it is to God that we have one another, that we're in community with one another, that we don't forsake becoming together like that. God gave us each other. And I'm thankful that God has made this place for us to come together and to encourage one another in the Lord. And I hope that if you're new here, that you can take advantage of what the Lord has for you at CCF with our community and, and feeling like, like having that community around you. Because I know how it is. It, it can be hard to live life and doing, trying to do things on your own accord. And so take advantage of what God has for you here. And if you've been here for a while and you know what I'm talking about, right? You felt that encouragement. You feel like you're growing in the Lord. Then I encourage you to be includers, invite people, invite people to be in. And because you know the benefit of being in a community of believers does. And so invite other people to come in. And so Paul knew how important this was. And so he wanted to go and strengthen those brethren and at all those established churches, but there was a problem. Let's look at the problem, verse 35. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. That's John Mark. We read, heard about him before. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Silas, and Paul chose Silas and departed 
being commended by the brethren to the grace of God, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And so now we see why Paul goes on this second missionary journey with Silas and not Barnabas, right? If you remember, we talked about this when we saw it happen, when we saw John Mark leaving them on the first missionary journey, when John Mark let them, uh, he left them back in Acts chapter 13. And we saw that Paul doesn't look, like, doesn't look at this as good. He, he looked at this as very, very bad. But in Acts chapter 13, chapter 13, verse 13, this is it, simple. We talked about this phrase, right? It says, John departed from them, returning to Jerusalem. And remember we talked about that word departed. In Acts chapter 13, it's the Greek word apokoroo. And Josh, you can correct me if I'm wrong when you look it up later, you, as you told me. But it simply means he left. He left. That's it. That's all. That's all it means. But here in, in verse 38 of Acts chapter 15, when Paul is describing this departing, it's a different word. The Greek word is aphistame, aphistame which means to revolt, to rebel against, to, to uh, somebody who essentially runs away, right? And so Paul sees this as a revolt, a, a, a desertion, and not following through. And so John Mark went with them on the first missionary journey, and there's a certain point in that first missionary journey where, where he says, all right, that's enough. Peace out. I'm going home. And, and just like the text tells us, Paul insisted they should not take with them the one who had departed from Pamphylia and had gone with them and not gone with them to do the work. And so Paul says, no, he's not coming. But I love the contrast of this. Look, look at verse 37. Barnabas was determined. That's verse 37. Verse 38, but Paul insisted. And so when you have one brother who's determined and another brother who's insisting, and they're not, they're not seeing eye to eye, right? I mean, these guys aren't budging on their stance, are they? They're, they're staying where they are. And, and Barnabas says, well, I'm determined we're going to do this. And then Paul says, well, I insist that we do not do this. And, you know, Barnabas says, I'm determined he's going to go with us. And, and Paul says, I insist he doesn't go with us. And a matter of fact, if he does go with us or go with you, I'm not going with you. That's, that's the how it was. And this contention, look at it in verse 39. The contention was, became so sharp. You know, I, I have to admit, parts of me don't like studying this, this type of thing. But also, I, I think the fact that this type of thing is in here it's proof to me that my faith isn't a blind faith, but it's a faith of substance. Because if they wanted it to look all perfect and everything, to, you know, oh God, blah, 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 you know, then they wouldn't have put this thing in here. They would have just left this argument out. But the fact that it's in here proves to me that, hey, this is true. This, they actually are, are, Luke's just like, this is it, right? And so it helps me believe that, this is, that what I'm reading is true because we see these arguments, these things, the humanness coming out. And so the tension came so sharp. You know, and I think about Paul and Barnabas, and I, and I think about them almost as like super, super prophets. Like, like they, that there's just love all the time. You want to think about them, in, you know, in that way. But something you notice here is Luke, the author of, of the book of Acts, his perspective. Luke does not give us a clue of who's wrong and who's right in this matter. And, and, I, and I think that's wise of him to do that. I think it's right that he didn't put forth who's wrong or right in this because, like, like I said a couple weeks ago, you know, I'm not the judge, right? And so Luke doesn't seem to want, put, want to put forth his judgment either. He's just saying this, telling the story. But it's never good when personal disputes flare up amongst people serving in ministry. Whenever you got a, a couple of brothers and sisters, and can I just read that again? The contention became so sharp. You know, so what does that mean? I mean, I'll be honest with you. When contention gets so sharp in my house, oftentimes yelling follows. So a lot of arguing back and forth. And so I can just imagine it's just getting really heated in that, in that room, right? Paul and Barnabas are there, and it's just getting really heated. Anger in the room, and there's really just bitterness, oh, argument over this matter. So much so, what becomes of it all? It says, well, if that's the way it's going to be, then we're not going to do ministry together anymore. We're splitting up. I'm done. And Barnabas could be like, you know what, Paul? God bless you. You can go wherever you want to go, but I'm taking my, my, friend, my, my cousin with me. And he could have said, because God doesn't give up on people. 
And then Paul would be like, God doesn't give up on people, but John Mark sure does, right? <laughs> and so you could just see how this tension is back and forth, back and forth so much that they had, they had to split up. And, and, and it can't help but think, well, who's wrong? Who's right in this? And, and like I said, there's a part of me that doesn't even want to be reading up on this. But on the other hand, it's really good that we read up on this type of thing. You know, earlier in the chapter, speaking of Paul, in verses 2 and verses 7, it says that there is no small dispute over the great doctrinal issue of how the Gentiles are saved, right? And we just talked about that. That letter was all about that. And in that, we're like, yes, Paul, stick to your guns. That's awesome. You know, be Mr. Stubborn for the gospel. That's great. But now we read this and we're just like, Paul, what are you doing? What, what, what is this? But you see, the same stubbornness that was gloriously used by God for standing up for the truth could sometimes get twisted. And then we see it getting twisted a little bit here. And now it's been said, it's being used to sort of, of the wrong way and the contention becomes so sharp. And we read that and we just kind of hang our heads, you know. It's a train wreck happening right in front of us with Paul and Barnabas. So much so that Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. Now, one thing I mentioned in chapter 12, and I just mentioned it a moment ago, but I want to remind you, according to Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, Barnabas and this John Mark guy, they were relatives. They were actually cousins. Now, think about that. Wouldn't it be hard to give up on your cousin? I mean, wouldn't it? I mean, it's your, it's your flesh and blood, especially for Barnabas, who is, who is nicknamed the encourager. He wants to encourage his cousin Mark to continue to... to do ministry for the Lord, right? And so we can get that way with family. I mean, we want to support and encourage our family in any way that the Lord may want to use them, right? And so that might explain kind of the depths of this, where, where, where Barnabas is like, hey man, this is my family. I, I, this is my flesh and blood. I'm not going to give up on them. And then Paul being like, forget it. You're just showing favoritism to your family. And on and on and on until they decided to split up. And the most amazing missionary team of Paul and Barnabas, guys we've seen the Lord use in, in so many wonderful ways up to this point, they split up. By what? It's by fighting. It's by fighting. Because they couldn't come to an agreement, because they couldn't come to an understanding of love and grace in this particular situation. And it says in verse 39, they departed from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. In verse 40, Paul chose Silas and departed. And so we see here that, that Barnabas and Mark took off in one direction, and Paul and Silas took off in another direction. And we'll talk about this Silas guy as we continue on through the book of Acts, because he does go on this second missionary journey. But I think about how difficult this was for these two guys, these two men who are doing ministry together. I think it was really difficult for them. Have you ever been in, in a sharp contention with another person or even another believer? I imagine that all of us can raise our hand and say, yes, we, we have at some point or another. And it's really bad, isn't it? I hate it. I hate it when that stuff happens. And, and, and you know, like, you're like staring off in a duel waiting for the other to blink. Or, or you know, you're, you're waiting for, see who's going to be more faithful in the Lord or who's not more faithful in the Lord. And, and whatever, however way you want to categorize it. There's, it's just a very difficult thing. But here's, but I'll tell you what the really good news is. There's no doubt that God used this division, right? I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and, I mean, Barnabas and John Mark do a great job. I'm sure they do. And we almost want to hear that, that one of these two groups was a disaster. Because then at least we would know that who's wrong or right. Whatever one was a disaster, obviously God's favor wasn't on. Then we can say, okay, they were wrong in this, right? They were the guilty party. But no, you know what? God blessed both of these parties. And we know he blessed Paul and Barnabas, or Paul and Silas, because we go on and read about that second missionary journey. But I think what's really glorious about this is that God uses this. But here's the thing. It doesn't make it right. You know, I think about the drug use and all the things that I used to do. And, and I think about how God's light shined on those things, and, and now he's using it for his glory, right? But it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right that I did all those things. And I think that Paul and Barnabas didn't have to have this contention between them. 
You might say, well, isn't it good that they split up? Well, well, yeah, God used it. But if they were really listening to the Holy Spirit, don't you think the Holy Spirit could have told them this? I mean, think about that. The Holy Spirit could have said, Barnabas, uh, you, take, uh, you, you take John Mark and go to Cyprus. All right, Paul, you take Silas, and I want you to go to Syria in Antioch. All right, I want you to travel there. But that's not how it unfolds. They're not listening to the Holy Spirit. They were, at least in some measure, these two heroes of the faith. And they're listening to the flesh, and it gets so bitter between the two. But you know what I think is wonderful? Later on, Paul says some very remarkable things about John Mark. He writes uh, about John Mark in a positive manner in uh, uh, Colossians 4 and Philemon uh, 2 and 2 Timothy 4. uh, And you see, God did the work of bringing these two to reconciliation, which is a marvelous, marvelous thing. And God does a work here in chapter 15 with, with this division, as we see in verse 41. They went off on their work, strengthening the churches. And that is an absolutely wonderful thing that came out of this. But you know what else is wonderful? Somewhere along the line, Paul and Barnabas had to forgive each other. They just had to. You know, there's always this phasing that we go through, I think. The first one's like this. I'm right and you're wrong. And yes, I'm going to forgive you, but not until you come crawling back to me. And, and, and then I'll forgive you and, and seeking forgiveness. That's the first phase of it. And then how does it work from there? Well, if your heart's full of grace of the Lord, after a while your heart softens up a little bit, doesn't it? At least it should. That your heart softens, you maybe even experience some, some time has passed and, and things, you're really thinking about it a little bit, and, and you can maybe see it from the, another person's perspective after having some time to think about it. And God just has a way of softening our heart, hopefully by grace. And actually, I, I heard a story that I want to share with you about Charles Spurgeon. I, I often talk about Charles Spurgeon. I haven't got to share anything about him lately, so I want to share with you with this. When he was a very young minister... He came to London, and there was a man there who was filled with bitterness and anger and complaints about something that happened like 15 to 20 years ago with uh, Spurgeon's predecessor. And and he was really venting out with Charles Spurgeon. He's like, you know, this guy did this, this guy did that, and all this. And he really wanted Spurgeon to take his side on the matter, right? Well, Spurgeon just paused and says, sir, didn't didn't this happen many years ago? And so the, the, the guy you know, grew indignant and, and kind of even angry at, at young Spurgeon. He says, sir, time does not change facts. Time does not change facts. And he was so convinced by the facts that he was right and everybody else was wrong. And that they, they needed to come crawling back to him for whatever forgiveness that would be dished out, right? And young Spurgeon, wise beyond his years, he says to the man, you're right. Time doesn't change facts. But when a man is walking in grace of Jesus Christ, he changes over time. Why haven't you become any more forgiving in that time that's gone by? I mean, I guess that, that's the question that I pose to you this morning at the end of this message. Because this is something that should resonate with God's people everywhere. And that is Forgiveness. It's just where we are as a people of of Christ, right? Forgiveness. There's probably someone in your life right now that you need to forgive. Or maybe you've struggled with. Maybe you've forgiven them and then that thought comes back into your mind and and you're struggling to keep forgiving them. And you wake up the next day and you're just discouraged by that same bitterness that keeps coming up. And so we need to realize that we need to keep forgiving it. We talk about this at Celebrate Recovery, one day at a time. That feeling comes up, take it to the Lord, say, God, help me forgive this person. I forgive them. We need to stay in that place of forgiveness. And listen, I know it. I know that you're right, and, and the other person, how wrong they are, right? I, I know I, I've been there. Paul and Barnabas, they've been there. And in those moments, we have to go back to this. We have to go back to how Jesus forgave us, right? How he forgave me. You want to know how Jesus forgives me? Jesus wants to be reconciled so bad with me and with you. This is what Jesus says to me. Aaron, you've done all the wrong in this relationship, and I have done nothing wrong. Isn't that right? It's all on me. I've done wrong. 
And this is what Jesus says. Jesus says, Aaron, put your guilt that, you, that we've done on me. I want to bear it. I want to bear it. And that's what he did on the cross, did he not? Jesus says, I know, you know what? Frankly, it's all you, you, you're all to blame for this. And I want you to put that on me. Put it on me on the cross. And Jesus says, I will pay the price. That's what he did to forgive us. Forgiveness is never accomplished without a payment of price, right? But Jesus shows us that sometimes it's the person who's doing the forgiving that needs to pay the price. And so maybe you're right. And I don't want to diminish that, right? Maybe you're right. But maybe this morning you desperately need to forgive that person. And so won't you just let the Lord soften your heart and stir up your heart right now and, and give to them something you've been unwilling to give them. Or maybe perhaps you've been unable to give it to them const- consistently thus far. This could have gone forward. This couldn't have gone forward with Paul and Barnabas without forgiveness. And do you know why? Because of how richly Jesus forgives us. So it's time for us to forgive somebody else if there's someone who's done something in your life because of how richly God's forgiven us.